Hello, and today in this video, we're going to be talking about my process and everything involved in creating luxury real estate films. Okay, and the first things first is going to be equipment. So on to the first and probably the most important thing you can take with you is cameras. I take four with me. Uh, the first being a Sony A7 III that remains on the gimbal pretty much all of the day. Um, and then it's backed up by my Sony A7S II. And that is kind of like on my hip. And uh, that I just sort of get details and sort of, you know, close up shots kind of thing. And thirdly, I have the Mavic Pro 2, which is all my gimbal shots and sort of crane style shots. And then the fourth camera that rarely gets used, but sometimes there's a swimming pool, uh, is the GoPro Hero 5. Okay, lenses. That's another thing that uh, I get asked a lot about. What do I shoot it on? So um, I, my main lens that uh, goes on the A7 III, which is on the gimbal, is this Samyang 14mm. Um, it's a 14mm f2.8. Um, I do like it. It's a, it's a great lens. It has a slight little bit of distortion, as you can probably see through some of these shots. Um, and ideally, I'd have liked to have got the uh, Leowa 12mm, um, but unfortunately, it was out of stock at the time, so, uh, so I couldn't get that, because the Leowa is, uh, I think it's actually called a zero distortion lens. Um, so that means all of the verticals and the horizontal lines are vertical and horizontal. There's no So, um, so ideally, I would have got that, but <clears throat> this, uh, this came a close second anyway. Um, and I'm thoroughly happy with it. It's autofocus as well. Um, so that comes in quite handy some of the time. So uh, it's very important that you do get a wide angle lens because you do want to make the rooms look large and grandioso. So um, this, I'd say 14 mil, um, maybe a 15 or a 16, a 16 to, to 35 is quite a popular lens. Um, but something I'd certainly say no, no, no tighter than 16 if you're going to be shooting real estate films. Okay, next up is the Sigma Art 24mm. Uh, this is a, a 1.4 f1.4 and again autofocus on this as well. Um, it's a very, very nice lens, quite a heavy lens, um, very heavy duty. Um, this stays on my A7S II most of the day. Um, it's got a very um, small focusing distance as well, which is great. So when you get those detailed shots, you get that lovely bokeh in the background. Pretty expensive, I'd say, but uh, it's a very, very nice lens. And with the APS-C uh, on the camera, you can, uh, this crops into like about a 35, I think it is. So uh, it kind of doubles up 24 or 35. I also have the 50 mil with me, Sigma Art 50 mil 1.4. That's actually shooting me right now. Again, great for that nice shallow depth of field. Uh, I use this for if I'm shooting models, yeah, or if I get the staff to do certain things uh, when I'm shooting on sticks, then I'll use the 50 mil. Uh, you'll see in these shots here. Again, it gives that lovely, um, nice, uh, slightly out of focus in the background if you're shooting on 1.4, which I do like. And then the last lens I take with me, you probably can't see it very well here, is the Sony 90 mil macro lens. Uh, this lens I use for doing all the nice sort of tight close-up shots of the food. Uh, you get some lovely macro stuff of the food, which is great. Um, so I mainly just use it for the, for the food photography and video. For stabilization, I use the Xeon Webuild Lab. I also have an underwater housing for the GoPro, and that gives that kind of like shot where you can see all the sea on the, beneath, on the lower half of the shot. And then you can see, you know, what's above on the top half and you can see the waves kind of like, you know, swishing through. Or if in a swimming pool, for example, if you somebody dived in, you'd be able to see them diving in from the top and then you'd be able to see them underwater on the bottom half of the, uh, the shot. So it's really nice for that. And they're relatively cheap, I think around about 70 or $80, something like that. I've got a Benro tripod, it's nothing special. Um, so any sticks will do really. Preferably sticks where you can adjust the height quickly is the, the most advantageous ones to get because uh, I don't like fiddling around with tripod legs. So I've got the ones that kind of like screw tight, which I find are the quickest ones. I have the Peak Design Arca Swiss plate um, holster. So it basically just sits on your belt and uh, so I can easily carry around my A7S II with my 24 mil. And uh, whenever I need it, I just pop it off the belt, take my shots, pop it back on, grab your gimbal and away you go. Other accessories, I use a small HD monitor. 
I find this is great because it's a five inch monitor. You can never really trust or see focus on the back of your screen on these uh, Sony cameras, way too small. Yes, yeah, so it's a great help having the focus peaking on the monitor and actually just seeing a bigger picture so you don't really have to you know, zoom in at all. I also have a peak design camera bag. I think I've got the 30 liter version. There's 30 and 50, I believe. 30 liters? I can't be 30 liters. Okay, on to camera settings. Everyone wants to know the settings. So I shoot in PAL first off. Um, probably just because I come from Europe, there's no other reason for it other than that. Uh, oh, actually there is, because on my Sony cameras, whenever you turn to NTSC, whenever you turn them on, it says, you're shooting NTSC, do you want to carry on? It's like, well, you know, obviously. I can understand them asking it once, but every time you turn the camera on, pretty annoying. So, um, yeah, so I shoot in PAL, I shoot in 50 frames per second, usually. Um, if I'm doing some model stuff, then sometimes I'll jump up to 100 frames a second. Um, I use a picture profile, as I just mentioned, S-Log2. Um, always have the exposure ratcheted up plus two um, on your EV. So um, that little scale on the bottom, uh, I always have that uh, to plus two and usually the two's flashing, yeah? So, um, so you know that you're not gonna underexpose it and therefore create those horrible grainy bits in the shadows. The ISO remains at 800. Sometimes I'll shoot in Cine 4 if I haven't got big huge windows and I'm just uh, capturing the room with no natural light coming in. So uh, Cine 4 will be used for that, um, which is a great picture profile, I love it. And uh, I shoot with the stabilization on and I shoot manual focus um, because I don't want it doing that focus hunting, um, which it still is prone to doing. So if you're know, doing a gliding shot kind of thing, you've got like a, a vase of flowers that will have you in front of you that you go past, more often than not, it'll try and focus on that vase of flowers and then it'll go back to focusing on the rest of the room and your shot's screwed. So um, I just pick my focus, usually just before infinity at the start of the shot, and then I'll stick with that manual focus all the way through that room. And then whenever I get to a new room, then I'll obviously refocus. And because um, sometimes when you turn the camera off and turn it on, it'll change focus. Um, if you swap out lenses, obviously it's going to change focus without you knowing about it. So I always check when I get into a new room to see that my focus is bang on. Okay, on to preparation. Um, firstly, it's quite important to figure out what the client actually wants to appear in their film. Um, and I've kind of like put this down to four different categories. First category being an architectural shoot. So this would be just shooting the interiors and the exteriors, just getting the beauty shots and cutting that film together. Second category would be to shoot architectural shots, beauty shots of the building, and to shoot guests, so real life guests, actually at the villa and enjoying their time at the villa and getting some candid shots of them doing so. Okay, the third way to shoot would be architectural with professional models. And it'd be important to find out what kind of demographic they would like for their models, uh, whether it be young couple, family, um, so you need to determine that with the client um, rather than what your preference would be. Um, so myself personally, I like to get sort of um, models who look like they would actually be in the villa, you know, so I wouldn't want some, you know, 20 year old <laughs> uh, couple running around um, having a frolic. Uh, I would prefer to have, you know, sort of, you know, somebody in their 30s, early 40s kind of thing that would, you know, really be staying in the villa um, to actually do the shoot with. Um, but again, that preference is down to the clients. And the fourth category would be an agent walkthrough, not 007, but like the real estate agent um, where he's just doing a piece of the camera and just walking through the property. I've never done one of these myself, um, but I have done them. And if it was requested, it'd be no problem. Just pop a radio mic on them and away you go. Okay, the next thing that I would do would be to create a call sheet. Um, this will be good to determine when you'd actually need the models. Um, to determine what time of day that you'd like to shoot certain rooms because they'd be west facing or east facing. Um, I ideally like to shoot rooms in the morning that have like a sea view um, because you get that lovely deep blue, blue sea rather than the afternoon and the golden hour, the sea kind of turns a black color and, uh, and that lovely, you know, bright blue is gone. So, um, so things like that and determining when to use the drone and uh, also when to schedule your couple shots and possibly uh, when to schedule in all the cooking. So um, yeah, so it's good to have a plan 
it sometimes obviously doesn't always go according to the plan, but it's good to have something to work through and, uh, and also, you know, give timings to people like the chef and like the models when they need to be ready kind of thing. Personally, myself, I like to start shooting early and finishing late. So I schedule the day to start around about 9 a.m. in the morning and then we don't finish shooting until 7, sometimes 7.30 um, when you've got that sort of twilight hour. Yeah, I'm super friendly to all of the staff and I'll introduce myself to everybody as soon as I get there. You gotta bear in mind that they're not used to having cameras pointed in their face or having a film crew and lighting and what have you um, around the villa. So it's best to keep everybody um, feeling as relaxed and chilled as possible. Crack jokes, you know, mine are terrible, but you know, just get a, one of those kind of dad joke laughs. So um, it's really, really good, yeah, to keep the, the humor up of the day and like, you know, to keep everyone's spirits up kind of thing. Because it is a long day. The next thing I do will be set up all of the gear. So for example, I'll get the drone out, set that up, make sure all the cards formatted. Um, I'll get my gimbal out, set that up, uh, get my sticks out, my lighting. So I set all that up so it's all ready to go. Okay, so the first bit of shooting that I start is with the interiors. As I touched upon earlier, I do like to get that lovely blue sea. And hopefully if you've got a blue sky to complement it. Uh, you can get overcast days and that can be a pain. Um, if you've got like foliage and stuff outside, overcast days are a blessing um, because it's much easier to expose for that. Um, but when it comes to the, you know, the lovely blue sea, you do need sunshine to light it up. Then I'll move on to some drone shots just before lunch. I personally myself like to get drone shots uh, where the light is coming from directly up above so that there's not much in the way of shadows being cast. Um, if you do it early in the morning or late in the afternoon and you get those long shadows, which obviously can be a look, um, but I personally like to shoot the, the architectural part and the, you know, the, the building part with it in consumed in light. Then onto the lunch, and usually there is a feast created. Um, these uh, chefs and these luxury villas are absolutely amazing at what they do. Um, they do make the food look like art and uh, it obviously tastes amazing also. So I do, depending on what the client wants, um, shoot the chefs preparing all the food and cooking the food and then I'll get the other staff to serve the food and then when all that's done uh, we actually get to eat the food which is great. After the lovely lunch then we'll go outside and we'll shoot some of the exteriors outside with a gimbal and the Sony A7S II getting all the detail shots usually takes around about an hour or so, maybe more, depending on the size of the villa. And then in the afternoon then, that's dedicated to shooting all of the models, uh, if they're required. And uh, I always get the models to have three changes of clothes. So they've got swimwear, and they've got like casual afternoon, daytime wear, and then casual evening wear as well. Then we're encroaching on kind of like the golden hour, um, which is a beautiful time of day to shoot. Um, if you're fortunate enough to get it. And with the golden hour, you've kind of got to be really quick because uh, it's nice to get some shots of the rooms again because uh, you get that lovely sort of sun coming through if it's a west facing room. Uh, you're also nice to get some of the model shots as well, walking around the villa. And it's also nice to get some drone shots. So you've only got like probably an hour and a half, two hours max. Um, and then it's twilight and then you're kind of done. So, um, so yeah, a lot to do, but it's obviously really worth it and staying around to that sort of 7, 7.30 mark. As with every video I create, I do like to have a sense of story in the film. And you might say to yourself, how come you can get a story into a real estate film? So it could be starting off with them entering into the villa. Yeah, so they've just arrived coming from the airport or wherever it might be. And they're just wandering around for the first time with wide eyes and wow and wonderment. Um, so that could be the sort of start to it. It could be that you start off with them waking up into the room and just having a breakfast in the morning. Um, so it, it definitely has a start and a middle and an end. The middle part could be um, the lunch part, you know, and then they'll have a little bit of a play around in the pool afterwards. And then for an end, um, sometimes if it's just an architectural shoot, I'll do like a kind of a hyperlapse backwards through the, the villa and then pulling out to like a drone shot, you know, revealing the whole of the villa and the surroundings and then pop up the titles. So, um, so yeah, so I do have a sense of story to it and it's not just a selection of beauty shots all cobbled together. Um, so I do believe there is a start and a middle and an end and it's quite easy to do that no matter what the genre. 
Okay, onto the music. This can be a bone of contention. Um, it's very difficult to find music that doesn't sound like elevator music. Um, I find piano mu music works quite well, kind of like um, cinematic and piano. So yeah, so music is a big, huge part of it. So um, it does, you know, enhance the film or, you know, take the film on a downward spiral if you get it wrong. So I would say it's actually a good thing to spend some time to actually choosing the music and getting it right. Okay, so we're gonna jump into a little bit of editing now. I've got two films lined up. I've got a 90 second film and I think it's a 120 second film. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of my workflow, a bit of my thought process. So let's jump in. Okay, so here we are in my NLE of choice, which is Final Cut Pro X. First things first is I would uh, go and get my music. So um, I shall show you the two programs that I use and there's no sponsorship deal here. So there is Soundstripe, which is the first one. And I quite like this. Um, again, it's got great search capabilities. I'm pretty much sure they've all got the same sort of thing nowadays. Um, but I do find it's like nice and intuitive and easy. Uh, another one I use is Artlist. So that will be here. And this one is a nicer interface, of <laughs> kind of a weird thing. I do prefer this one just because the screen is a dark color, dark background, whereas uh, the white background is a bit, uh, bit intense. Next thing we go on to is culling the footage. So if you can see up here in my projects bin, I've uh, created one, two, three, four, five projects for this video. Um, took me a while to get used to the Final Cut Pro, the way it does things, um, and their sort of filing system, but I got there in the end. Okay, so yeah, so I have all of my ooh, A7S2 footage on on our little project, all of my A7 III footage on a project, which is usually my gimbal camera, so all of the gimbal shots will be on here, as you can pretty much see. Uh, the Charter Villa, that's the actual final video, um, and then I've got my drone, uh, shots and the drone shots are here and what I do is when I go through uh, I'll chop the tops and tails of each clip so that they're ready to go and uh, show you here for example so I'll, I'll have the, the top and the tail of it so I'll ch cut off all the chaff so just the good part of the shot is there <clears throat> and then I'll move on to the next shot and then once I've culled all of the footage then I'll go back into my main project which would be the child of villa in this case and then i will start assembling it all from start to finish there so as you can see here i've got my music track um, that we've chosen and usually the music track doesn't isn't the right length for my film yeah so i think in this instance it was three something odd minutes i don't believe that you need three minutes to showcase a villa so my villa videos are usually about 90 seconds to maybe 120 seconds. And in this case, it's the latter. So as you can see here, I've chopped up this music track and um, I just used fades um, to sort of sync up the beat. Um, I use these uh, little markers so I can sync up the beat and uh, get it on the right place to actually do the cross dissolve or the cross fade. So here you can see I've done one here. That is. Didn't notice the thing, did you? No. And uh, and then I've done one on the end here as well. So. Always do it. It's very rare that I actually find a, a music track that is the right pace all the way through and the right length, yeah, it just doesn't happen. So, um, so I'm consistently um, adjusting the audio, lengthening it, shortening it, what have you. So the, the the first thing that goes down is the, the music track. I'll get that done so I've got the right length for my film. The next thing I do is I put these little uh, black boxes in because um, I don't like using the Final Cut Pro magnetic timeline. I find it mildly annoying. So um, this disables it, if you like and uh, enables you to edit in a way that I was used to in Premiere. 
So uh, any Premiere users out there thinking of coming over to Final Cut Pro, there is a way for you to edit in the style of Premiere. All right then, so uh, first things first, um, we start laying down the shots in here and assembling the footage and doing any time remapping. So um, any of those little sort of um, speedy uppy bits or slowy downy bits, I do that in here so that it's in time with the music so that the next shot that comes in <clears throat> Is going to be in the right place so i don't have to do any adjustments later so all of the culling and then the assembly of this is and the time remapping is done at the same time okay here for example um we got her to do this about four or five times and shot it from different angles always good to get different angles um, that shot there was a shot where she walked all the way up the stairs and all the way inside but I didn't end up using it because the stairs wasn't that pretty so we just cut to the bit where she got to the garden. Again I always usually get two angles of them doing a task, two or three angles. This was uh, the Chada which is actually the name of the villa so they wanted that in there, they specifically said they wanted the shots of that, they're very expensive. Yeah, I had to uh, change that shot there. It was uh, requested that uh, they didn't want to see any of the sugar. She put a spoonful of sugar in there. So I changed that up to make it more healthy looking. Okay, so we're coming up for a big hit. There's like a bit of a build in the music here, and I love the builds. And uh, you want to sort of match the audio in the video to sort of give a big bang when it comes in the hit. Boom, there's a villa. Um, my uh, note on this uh, ship, we didn't actually have any models. Um, so the girl that you see here is one of the girls from the, uh, the real estate agents. And uh, she did all the modeling and she's quite happy to do so. Yeah, so I love it. I love uh, tracks where it's not just one pace all the way through and it sort of breaks it up. It has a build at the start and then it has a big drop and then slows down and then, you know, comes to a nice um, close at the end. So that's the way I like my music. Okay, so the next thing that I do is color grading. Um, well, I guess you could say it's color correction first and then grading. Um, so I like to use scopes and I've got a keyboard shortcut. Um, to bring up my scopes and um, here you see I like to keep all of um, my levels in sync here so I like to keep all of the the shadows um, above zero and uh, I like to keep all the highlights below a hundred where possible um, and that's kind of like a general rule that I have so in order to do that um, I use the color wheels here so if we just take off this LUT it obviously changes what the um, RGV curbs will look like and uh, if we take off our color here and our sharpening let's take it back to how it was Doom. okay so that's how it was um, I believe I shot that in S log 2 um, so the first thing that I'll usually do is pop some color wheels on and uh, in this instance I popped two different sets Quite often what I do is I'll copy and paste and it looks like on this one I've copied and pasted from others. So um, let's look at the color wheel. So I took the shadows down a touch here. Um, I raised the mid tones a touch and then I dropped down those highlights. Now that's the initial kind of like um, color correction. Um, but what happens is and what's happened in this instance is once you have um, applied this, if you apply any more effects to it, then you're gonna see more of a difference. So we've got the color wheels here. Let's enable the color board. That's the next thing that I usually do. And uh, it varies from shot to shot. So you can see that's without and that's with. So here, I didn't really wanna add any color to the highlights, but I wanted to add color to this kind of like wood background here, this beautiful wood background. Um, so 
if you add color to the highlights in this particular instance, the skin goes like a really yellowy color, so I don't really want that. Um, and yeah, really the color that I want to bring up is like, you know, the, the lamps here in this background. So I just did the mid-tones and the shadows. And uh, let's go back and see what else we got on there. I added a sharpen, I always add a bit of a sharpen to it. Um, and the amount is just the default amount, 2.5. Um, and I've pasted on some more color wheels here to give it a, a, a bit more oomph. And uh, and then we've got another color board on there to um, add a bit more color to the background there. Once I've done that and I was happy with that, then I will go and add a custom LUT. And I do like the way that they work in Final Cut Pro because it means that you don't have to load in each one so with this particular way of doing it you just apply this custom LUT which is an effect and then it, you have you load in your all of your LUTs within this program here and they all they're all appear here in the drop down menu so this is one folder this is another folder so on and so forth um, so in this instance I use punch um, <clears throat> which is quite a an obvious one um, it just kind of like gives it a bit of a, a contrast kind of curve um, so that's a popular one I use another one I sometimes use is enhance and that just pops up the colors and what have you um, another good thing is you can adjust the amount of the LUT that goes into it so you've got a little slider here which is really good and uh, we've even got me M31 LUT in there oh look at that so yeah so uh, so the last thing that I would do would be to apply the LUT I'll put that punch there and you can see now over here the RGB curves have changed but the majority of them are below this 100 um, and above the zero which is obviously a good thing so um, so I'm happy with that so yes yeah, so then I'll go and I'll just color grade all of the clips and a lot of them you find uh, if you're in the same sort of scene or the drone shots whatever you can just copy and paste the uh, the grade that you did to it um, so that you don't have to keep um, doing a correction and a grade to every individual shot you'll find that you can just copy and paste it to um, to many of the same shots which is probably what I did here because this room all looks very same kind of lighting yeah these two rooms so I just copied and pasted it so uh, yeah so once the color grade is finished um, then I'll go and add some effects and um, some rather amazing effects um, are this effect here and it's called um, M flare yeah M flare 2 I should say um, and it's this thing here basically it adds like anamorphic flares to the uh, to the footage um, but it's great because they're totally customizable and you can animate them uh, within the actual program so within Final Cut Pro and the most beautiful thing of all is that it literally renders out in real time so you can just play it back um, and if you want to make an adjustment to it at all so here's the sort of um, the interface for it if you wanted to make any adjustments you know to the brightness or whatever you can just play it back and it, it just does the real-time playback it does the real-time playback without any um, juddering and it's just remarkable um, so yeah so like I say it's really customizable you can you know uh, change where you want the Sun to go um, you can change where you want the the accents of the sun to go um, and there's a whole plethora of different um, like uh, presets that they give you you can make your own as well and color it and uh, you can track it so you can track the sun across the sky uh, it's just really really amazing uh, program and it just adds a little bit of um, amazingness to the uh, to the production and uh, if you've got a bit of a boring shot you know this can uh, sort of add a lot to a boring shot make it a bit more exciting so uh, I, I don't use it everywhere um, I you know use it on drone shots it's pretty cool for drone shots um, and obviously shots that would suggest that there was sun in it I wouldn't just put um, you know these kind of effects on an interior room or anything so be careful with it um, because it is quite addictive and transitions are also another um, thing that I use quite a bit and um, I've got quite a few of these transitions that I've bought from various companies, the Hyper Zooms and what have you, Liquify, Luma Pop. Um, some of them are free, some of them you pay for, um, but I do like Final Cut Pro the way that it does handle transitions, and uh, because a lot of the time in Premiere you just couldn't 
do it or you have to like put five or six different layers on top of each other to get this effect i mean it's just so antiquated or you'd have to go into after effects to do it so i love the way that in final cut pro you can do the transitions within the program no problem without having to leave and go to a third party another thing i love about um final cut pro is that you can do transitions through the text editor so uh there's a chap called ryan nangle and uh, he's done a couple of cool ones. So basically when you get to the stage of you've got a shot, you've got nothing to the end of it, and all this shot here doesn't have anything before it, you know, to sort of cut that transition in, you can actually do it with um, these ones. So you just put a little layer on top, so you zoom in, zoom out, you can kind of give a little preview of what it does. Spin anti-clockwise, pan up, pan right. Um, so we'll just use a zoom in one. So all you do is just pop them on top of the actual uh, two clips that you wanted to transition without affecting the clips at all. And then as if by magic, it makes a transition. It's really, really cool. Um, like I say, if you haven't got enough space at the start or the end of a clip, uh, it's a really great way to do a transition. Um, they're not mega adjustable. You can um, adjust the amount that it zooms in um, on both of them. So it sort of accentuates the effect. Um, but it is just a super cool, quick way of doing a, a transition. Um, so yeah, highly recommend that Ryan Nangle stuff. Um, so that's really, really great. Another one that I use quite often is um, is a tracker. So if you want to sort of float the text in the air kind of thing as the drone's floating through the air, that kind of stuff. Um, this is a really good one and a really quick one. And again, in Premiere, you just couldn't do this. You'd have to go to After Effects. I love the fact that you can do these really cool effects within Final Cut Pro and you don't have to actually leave the program and go to another one. Okay, so we're on to the next Villa video now and a couple of side notes. These are last the two examples that I've shown you, they're for rental, okay? They're not for sale. So I think there's a little difference in the way that I would shoot a rental compared to a sale. With a sale, I'd get more of the details. With a rental, it's more about the vibe and the feeling of the place. Um, so yeah, there's a slight little um, difference between the two. So this uh, is a beautiful, um, I don't know how much it costs, but um, pretty penny, I'd imagine. Um, this particular villa is just north of Phuket, um, right alongside the beach. Um, so it's a beautiful beachfront property. So um, we'll just go to the initial shot. This shot I did with a drone, obviously, and um, shot it in 4K. Um, so then that's how I could do this little twist kind of thing on the on the intro shot. Let's take a look. So you can see I do a lot of sort of speed ramping. Shoot everything 50 frames a second so you have that uh, ability to, you know, make it smooth. And pretty much shot all of this in S-Log 2. Again, we had these uh, sort of darkened walls in most of the interior shots, which are always tricky. There's the build and the music. Yeah, so that was like the little ending uh, that I sometimes like to do, uh, where I just sort of like do a reverse out of the, the whole, I do a reverse out of the whole of the uh, villa. So it kind of like gives it a nice little sort of um, end to the video kind of thing. So you can see whoosh, whoosh, zooming out, zooming out. And usually I reverse the shots that I shot. Uh, so it's as simple as that really. 
and then uh, coming out to a nice drone shot at the end. Okay, I hope that was of interest to you and you managed to soak up some of that information and that information was worth soaking up. I'm thinking of starting off an online course very shortly because I've got lots of behind the scenes um, that we've shot uh, on location. So I think that could be of interest. So if it is, please leave a comment down below and please do that subscribe thing and hit the little bell and I shall hopefully be seeing you in the next video.